afternoon. Today we're going to talk about sensory evaluation. Now I want to preface this that in an hour and 15 minutes there's no way I can really fully educate you on what sensory evaluation is. I teach a whole course in this. So sensory evaluation is a component of meat science because all the things that we talked about whether that was pre and post harvest factors, whether it is uh, flavor or color or packaging or any of those, most of them have used sensory as a way to measure changes. So sensory is a very important component. And what we're going to do this afternoon is, first I want you to understand the environmental factors psychological and physical factors that affect sensory grooming. And then understand, in general, the three different types of methods that we use to evaluate meat. Now, I do want to say that meat science um, has used sensory evaluation uh, clear back into the 1940s, but most of the sensory evaluation really became part of research in the 1960s and then really into the 70s. And the American Meat Science Association has a sensory guideline. It's being redone. I'm one of the editors. Actually, the only reason that you don't have a new version of it is because of me. So sorry about that. But I gave all of you the current version, a PDF, and you can cite that, and it really is a good guide. We're going to divide that into three areas, uh, starting hopefully after the new year, where we'll have cookery, and then we'll have the sensory part, and then we'll have instrumental. But why conduct sensory? Sensory evaluation is considered a science. There's a professional meeting. If you remember, I went to a professional meeting in September, and it was a Society of Sensory Professionals. IFT also has a section that is the sensory uh, section of IFT. The IFT section mainly deals with food, and the Society of Sensory Professionals deals with all aspects of sensory. Uh, there are a lot of people that felt that sensory was not a science, it's not repeatable, but that it can be a repeatable measure. And the one key about sensory is that it uses humans as sensory instruments. Because we have a product, we have a meat product, we want to know what people think about it. So sensory is used in research, and it's also used in quality control. And you can conduct sensory using trained panels or untrained panels. So right now, I want you in your mind to have two columns, trained panel evaluation, untrained panel evaluation. We're gonna talk about the different methods that we can use to evaluate meat. And two of those methods can use untrained panelists but one method for sure uses trained panelists. So trained panelists are those people that are trained for one or more sessions. As you may know, we have a trained panel here at Texas A&M. They are an expert panel because they've had months of training. An expert panel, according to the American Society of Testing Materials Subcommittee E18 on Sensory Evaluation, the other professional organization for sensory scientists, says that an expert panel are those that have 20, uh, 200 or more hours of training. And our panel has been in existence for over 31 years, and while not every single panelist has been there that long, they all have over 200 hours of training. So they are considered to be an expert. And the objective using trained panels are to help them to determine differences or describe the product and to give us a quantitative value of differences in products. So trained panels are human instruments. They have been altered. They are, you're never allowed to ask a trained panelist what they think or what they like or what their preference is because they are not normal. They have been altered and they think differently than consumers. You don't want to eat with trained panelists because they're always evaluating. Untrained panelists are, con are also called consumers, and these are people who have not been influenced by training, 
but that we can use to help determine preference for products, their like and dislike of products, and they can rank in order of preference uh, as well. Untrained panelists are really important because they're the people who purchase the product. They're the people that we want to understand. We can use trained panels to help us understand attributes to the product and what the products are. And then we can come back and use untrained panels for consumers to understand what they like. And at the end of this lecture, I'll kind of tie some of those components together for you. So, why are there some people who still don't really know if sensory is a science or not? And it is because we have five senses, sight, sound, uh, let me see if I can get sight and sound and taste and feeling. And which one am I missing? Sight, sound, feeling, part, oh, and smell. Yeah, I can get smell. Five basic senses. And we take in information on a day-to-day -day basis with those senses. That information, uh, is it, depending on the sense that we're using, there is a receptor of some type. There, uh, it gets a signal, and that signal is sent to the brain, and we interpret it. And one of the problems is, is that with sensory, sometimes we have multiple signals going to the brain and we don't always understand uh, what is coming, we just know that there is some effect. Also, a lot of things can influence the sensory, uh, the sensory verdict. So we talk a lot about the testing environment and what we as sensory scientists are trying to do is to, uh, is to evoke a a response, have people evaluate something, and then to understand their perceptions of it. So we, our objective is to have a sensory panel response due to a product and not due to testing procedures. I can alter what you think about a product simply by putting it in a different container. I can also change your perceptions of a product based on the environment. If you have a nice, quiet environment where you can think, I provide you the product, you have a pure evaluation of it, that's one thing. But if I give that product to you in the middle of, mall, of a mall on Black Friday where there's lots of activity, there are a lot of distracting factors. How you perceive a product a coffee product, I brought some co different coffee products and I brought a Starbucks product. So when you walk into Starbucks, oh, that Starbucks smell, you all know what that is, right? Your perception of coffee in a Starbucks is different than your perception of coffee uh, sitting outdoors, looking out over your pasture and your horses in uh, a 60 degree environment where you're relaxed. Your perceptions are different. Your perceptions of coffee are different if I brought you coffee in this classroom uh, versus if I had you at Starbucks. So it's the environment that will also influence. Because you're getting a sensory stimulus from a product, doesn't mean that we can turn off all the other sensory stimulus that are in the environment. So as sensory scientists, we talk about test controls, product controls, and panel controls. And these are things that we do while sen doing sensory evaluation to try to remove biases from, uh, from the product so that the, the response we get is due to the sensory properties of the product, not due to the testing procedure. So let's talk about each one of those briefly. Test controls, what are test controls? Te I made a list here. Uh, test controls are the test room design and location. For example, our panelists are not allowed to go into the sample preparation area. They walk up the stairs, come to the third floor in the elevator, whatever, come in and they either go to the back corner lab which is where we do panel training, or they go into the booths depending on what we're doing that day. 
they're not allowed in the panel prep in the sample preparation area. One of the problems we have here at Texas A&M is we have very poor airflow design in this building in Clayburg. And everything that we cook in room 343 is aerated throughout the whole building. We would like them not to um, smell anything or have any idea of attributes prior to walking in and evaluating a product. So that's a problem we have with our test design that we're tr actually trying to fix. The location, third floor of Claybrook, not ideal. My panelists are used to coming here now. But the first day of classes in the fall, we do not run sensory panel. We try not to run that first week of classes because the panels have to park over at 74. They have to get through all the traffic that all of us have to also get through. They have to make sure they don't hit anybody. They don't have an accident. Usually they've already seen an accident. By the time they get up to the third floor, uh, and we've just come off of summer where everything's been more relaxed and they've had uh, not very much traffic to deal with. They're sitting around going, did you see the traffic today? <laughs> you know, like, Arr. they really don't have the ability to evaluate product objectively. Uh, we let all of them you know, get used to the traffic flow just like we have to get used to it and then evaluate. We have booths. We have three sets of booths. Uh, those booths are used to reduce communication between panelists. They're also used to keep panelists from the sample preparation area and to minimize transfer of odors or any information with the product uh, while we're serving it. And the booths need to be comfortable. They need to be able to have different lighting sources used depending on what product. Because sometimes we want to mask that so they can't see things in the product. Sometimes we don't want to do that. Um, we also have a descriptive evaluation and training area. Right now, that's the back sensory lab. It needs to be clean. It needs to be odor free. It needs to have no information about the product uh, there. And it needs to be a, a room. We, I would love to have a room like this, like 300, that I had a round table in the middle with a lazy Susan that where I could also control the lights and they weren't fluorescent, <laughs> but I could change the light bulbs out if I needed to. There's a lazy Susan in the middle that has all their references and I can see all of them at once. And the only thing that happens in this room would be panel training. It would have filtered air. There would be no odors. There would be uh, the humidity and the temperature would be controlled to be constant so that there's no information imparted by the test room. Uh, the preparation area would have good ventilation. The biggest problem we have right now is we have no ventilation. And so everything that we do, everybody in Claybrook knows what, it, what we're doing that day. And if we have something that uh, in the preparation area, say we have a sample that's somewhat spoiled or has off flavors, everybody smells it, the panelists are already anticipating what, what might be in the sample. We also need the preparation area to be odorless, to have equipment that we need to prepare the product. We're always cooking. So we have lots of different cooking methods. We have flat grills. We have actually a serrated gas grill we could use. We have different types of consumer preparation methods that we could use. We also have um, electric flat grill or George Foreman, which I hate because they don't cook meat very well. Anything that we need there for preparation. We also, in the preparation area, um, have cleaning utensils so that we can clean products and that we can, um, if, after we wash the products, that we can make sure that they're odor free. We have an office facility, ours happens to be in the preparation area, uh, where we enter data and where we can uh, do their, our statistical analysis. We need entrance and exit areas that are easy and accessible and where the panelists will not receive any information. Uh, someday we are hoping that we will uh, eventually have a new sensory facility 
that would be off campus or off uh, from this main area that would be easy for people to come in. They would have their own entrance and exit and they would go right to the sample preparation, um, not to the sample preparation area, but to either the, uh, the to the training area or the test booths and not have to walk by the preparation area. Uh, the general design factors, we need to be able to, to uh, we need everything to be neutral. If you go into the sensory lab, the reason that we have off-white uh, surfaces is not because that was the cheapest thing when they were bidding out uh, the, the um, uh, building this building, but it's because we needed neutral uh, surfaces that would not absorb any odors and that wouldn't impart any color effects. We'd like uh, the lighting. Uh, we have we had the ability in the booths to have uh, white light, cool light, warm light, red light, green light, amber light, any light that we want, and we can also control the intensity of that light. Our air circulation is almost non-existent, but we have air. So how we deal with that is we have a bunch of air purifiers that we turn on and try to keep the air circulating and keep it pure. We uh, want the temperature and humidity to be standardized. I would love to have filtered air all the time with standard temperature and humidity. The booths that are closest to room 300 here, we don't use very often because they're right along the wall where the cooler and freezer is. That room is always cold. Now, I love that room, but most people who live in Texas don't like that room and are uncomfortable, so we try not to use it. We want all of our construction materials to be odorless and also able to sanitize. I would love to have stainless steel throughout all the preparation areas where I knew that I would never have any odor imparted and that I would never have any bacterial growth and that I could easily wash it down and sanitize it. So all of these things are test controls. They're not, they're very important because what they do is if we can control all these things, we're not going to impart any bias and our environment's going to be the same every day. We also have product controls. Product controls are things that you do with your product that may either affect the sensory properties or give information about the sensory properties of a product. And we have general equipment such as uh, a spatula that doesn't, that we have to make sure, I prefer stainless steel for everything. But some of our surfaces were not able to do that. Uh, we need something that is won't, will not scratch. We want, uh, if we need uh, a stir spoon, each product gets its own stir spoon. Uh, if we're going to use, uh, do consumer cooking and we need to use cast iron skillets, the cast iron skillet is clean before the next sample is put into it, or we have enough cast iron skillets so that every sample has, has its own, uh, own, own product. When we're doing sample preparation, we make sure we have enough supplies and equipment to prepare the samples. Normally, we'll do eight to 12, maybe 15 samples a day to make sure that we don't have any cross-contamination and flavors or odors or anything like that. Our materials all have to be uh, odor neutral. Uh, sometimes we do projects where we change what, uh, what materials we use because it's part of the experimental design. Normally though, those materials need to be standardized and used for every product. Uh, we uh, have gone to extensive uh, uh, measures to make sure that uh, our preparation procedures and all our materials and supplies are consistent. When we were doing con large consumer studies from traveling all over the US, the graduate students had to actually take a 300 pound grill and move it from location to location, so we used the same grill. We also shipped our own crock pot and shipped our own uh, other cooking mechanisms to make sure that every time we prepared a product, whether that was a consumer in Philadelphia or a consumer in Portland, Oregon, or in Kansas City, that we're using the same procedures and that they received the, a, a product that had been prepared and could be the same as much as possible as what the consumers in the other cities We also worry a lot about sample pre presentation. So I put up two, uh, two drinks up here, thinking about me going to Aruba. Uh, 
that uh, look wonderful, don't they? Uh, if we were evaluating these, and um, they were supposed to be margaritas, but I don't know if they really are margaritas. They're some type of a fruit drink, right? So if we were going to do fruit drink evaluation for this formula, and we decided this is how the sample needed to be prepared, we'd have to make sure the same umbrella was in every sample, that the cherry and the pineapple here, the toothpick was the same, the straw was the same, there's the same amount of liquid and ice in each product uh, because we want no information going with that sample. We couldn't put some in one size of a stem glass and some in another. And if you go into the sensory lab, we have a, uh, on that back area, we have all kinds of glassware up there. That glassware is there because depending on the project, we may, need, we may have needed different types of glass. We use a Bodum double wall glass for our coffee evaluation. Uh, and then we have used little custard dishes for rice evaluation. So depending on the product, we may change that container. How much sample size do they need standardize that? I said that this had to have the same amount of liquid and had to be prepared exactly the same way for both of those, uh, depending on what the treatments are. For meat, we always worry about do we give them a half a steak or a half of a pork chop? Do normally we give two or three half inch cubes. Each of those are, uh, each cube is a bite. We want people to have at least two bites and depending on what they're evaluating, potentially three. Uh, I, if I could, I would give everybody a steak, but that would be too many steaks from a treatment. So uh, the nice thing when we take a steak and cut it into half inch cubes and give two to three cubes to a, con to a trained panelist or to a consumer, four to six people can eat from a steak. So we get evaluation across steaks. The serving matrix and, and, uh, needs to be the same. Uh, if you're using white plastic plates, you have to use white plastic plates that are the same size in every location. If you're gonna give them uh, a half a pork chop on a white plastic or a clear plastic plate, then, and you're gonna give them a knife and fork, it has to be the same knife and fork with the same amount of serrations on the knife so that they can cut the sample and use the same amount of force uh, to evaluate uh, all of that. The serving temperature needs to be tightly controlled. We would like probably to be 120 degrees when it is served to panels, so product may be coming off the grill and it's gone to an internal temperature of 165. By the time we cut it and serve it to the panel, we really want that product to be no lower than 120. And we have warming ovens that are set at 120 and warming systems. So we want that to be consistent. We don't want it to be cold because the temperature may influence the flavor of the product. Order served. We randomize order usually. There's first order biases in products. What that means is that the product that you taste first, many times you like it better, your, your senses are fresher and you're more sensitive, you're gonna get more information to the brain from your sensory uh, organs. And so uh, it's very important that you randomize order so that you can pull that effect out. We use three digit random codes to identify because we do not want A, B, C. We don't want one, two, three. All those things imply order or preference. We all like A's more than C's. We all like to be first instead of third. So we use three digit codes that are randomly selected on a random number table so that there's no information given with the product or any bias. The number of samples that we serve uh, varies depending on the project. I mentioned earlier that for the panel, we would only have, uh, the train panel would only evaluate eight to 12 samples, sometimes uh, 15. When we do coffee sensory, we do three samples a day. That's all, because it takes a lot of time. So it depends on the product, uh, but you need to pay attention to that. And we wanna make sure the panels do not have sufficient time to evaluate all the attributes and that we take steps to remove taste bud fatigue and to be able to cleanse the palate between samples to make 
each sample evaluation as fresh as possible. I'm sure that when you take a test, by the time you get to the end, you, you feel fatigued, you don't care as much as you did when you started the test. That's the same type of thing we're trying to avoid with the number of samples. And how much sampling, uh, product sampling amount. When we did uh, aromatic rice, we put a half a cup in a preheated uh, glass custard dish. They didn't need that much, but there was enough of that so that they could evaluate the texture attributes, which would take them about 10 minutes to do because they'd have to take multiple uh, multiple tastes to do the different evaluations. We knew we were giving them a lot of extra, but we also, because it's a pretty homogenized sample, wanted to give them enough so that they, from the center of the pot, so that they could sample it. So those things all are very, very important. Panel is control. So if we control the environment, then we control the product and how we sample the product. We also have to control the panel. Uh, and we have trained and untrained panels. Uh, for a trained panel, uh, the amount of training and orientation that we give them is very, very critical. We're going to briefly talk about that in a minute. But the information we provide to them is going to change their mental perception and what they understand and what they know. And because of that, uh, we want to make sure that they all have the same orientation and the same training. Uh, also, uh, what time, depending on what product, we would evaluate at a different time of the day. I prefer to do uh, evaluations in the morning. People are more mentally alert in the morning than in the afternoon. There hasn't been as much information going to their brain. They haven't had to make as many decisions. Our training panel, we use uh, people from the community. They're not graduate students in general, unless they're a graduate student who's learning how to be a panelist and then wants to be a sensory professional. And the reason for that is that they come in and they have a job to do. So we like to start at 9, 9, 30, 10. We let the panelists decide. And we only run two hour sessions. We do some evaluation in the afternoon. The, we like to start about two or three. We want them done by five. Uh, two is a little bit better time. Now, it, it is product dependent. Uh, eating potato chips early in the morning may not bode well with your digestive system and with what you think is important. Chocolate, my thought is you eat chocolate any time of day and it's acceptable. Um, we did our coffee panel in the afternoon. You don't want to do it too late because those that are very caffeine sensitive may not be able to be on the panel. Uh, we, we don't want them to drink coffee uh, first thing in the morning uh, because they may associate that with their first cup of and one of the things that I haven't talked about, but I'll talk about briefly here for panelist control, is we also need to have them evaluate the product when, uh, when they're not hungry. At least an hour prior to panel, they cannot have had coffee or any other strong drink. Uh, they cannot wear uh, either personal care products that impart a strong aromatic their clothes, they cannot launder their clothes so that they have a strong aromatic because that would influence the environment. Uh, that's why a lot of times, like in this previous slide, uh, it showed people with um, lab coats on. That's one way that you can eliminate that. But we spend a lot of time making sure that the panelists are well trained, that they're comfortable, that their environment doesn't affect them, and that they understand how to use the scales, and that they understand what, what to expect, what time is going to be expected of them. When we do consumer evaluation, we want to make sure that we've done an orientation. It gives them the information that they need. Uh, if you're doing a consumer evaluation and you tell them you're going to, they're going to need an hour of their time, or an hour and 15 minutes of their time, and you go two hours, I can tell you that the last samples they evaluate, they are not going to have the same care. It's important then that we do an order, uh, use order to pull out variation in the statistical analysis. We really try to uh, give them that time frame and stick to it. So those are examples of test controls, environmental controls, and panel
metabolism control. And I want to take a few minutes to talk about other factors, the factors that influence sensory burning. Because sensory is, um, uh, because we have five senses and all that information is going to a very similar location in the brain, uh, we very subconsciously take in information that sometimes we don't really realize we do. But there are also physiological and psychological factors that have been shown to affect sensory burning. So we do things to try to control those. Some of these are panels controls, some are environmental controls, and some of them are test controls. So uh, the physical factor, uh, the, the biggest physical factor that we work with is adaptation. Adaptation is that decrease in or changes in sensitivity to a given stimulus as a result of continued exposure to that stimulus or a similar one. When you jump into the swimming pool, first it's cold. Five minutes later, your body's adjusted and it's warm. That's adaptation. When we eat food products, as well, or feel fabric, or uh, feel a lotion on your skin, all that sensory, right? What happens is the first, um, the first response is always the purest, and then you're going to have some adaptation. What we do for our panel is we uh, time between samples. If they eat sample and then eat a sample and eat a sample and we push them to be done too fast, then we're gonna have adaptation responses because they're not gonna have a chance to try to cleanse their palate, cleanse their senses, and have things return to normal. The other thing we do with adaptation is we have um, palate cleansers, usually salt, saltless saltine crackers in water. We might use ricotta cheese. We might use bagel, plain bagels. Uh, we might use apples, things like that. There are usually a series of things that they would do to make to try to get their senses back to normal, so that we do not have adaptation responses. We're always going to have a little bit of adaptation. There's also cross adaptation, cross potentiation, which is where interaction of one stimulus uh, changes the perception of another stimulus. I'm not really going to talk about those because I think that you, the most important thing is that I want you to understand that adaptation is an important response. Also, a uh, second physical factor is enhancement or suppression. And this involves the interaction of stimuli that are presented simultaneously as mixtures. So for enhancement, enhancement is the effect of the presence of one substance increasing the perceived intensity of the second substance. You can think about enhancement. One of the classic examples of enhancement is, I brought this ax in. I brought this in because you guys evaluated this when we were talking about it as umami. And uh, this is basically MSG. If you have a, a beef roast and you eat it without oop, accent and with accent, the beef ID or the, that basic beef flavor, not the salt flavor, not anything else, but that, uh, and not the umami, just the beef flavor is enhanced in the one that has the accent added. Uh, it's obviously going to have more umami because this tastes like umami. And it's also going to have more salt flavor because this is um, this has sodium in it. But uh, but the beef note that that is specifically beef will also be enhanced. There's also synergy, and that's the presence of one substance increasing the perceived combined intensity of two substances. Um, we use synergy, uh, or synergy might be present in very complicated food products where they're actually trying to get some synergy. And I think about margaritas, because I have the picture of a, of a tropical drink. Margaritas have sweet, salt, and sour flavors in them. Uh, you may not individually identify those, but if you take out one of those, uh, if you take out the sweet, uh, you realize that the salt and, and the, the sour uh, are not as prevalent because there is, uh, or it, it may be, there may be a synergy there. We can also have suppression where the presence of one substance decreases the perceived intensity of a mixture of two or more substances. We use suppression to try to suppress off flavors. 
probably one of the greatest uses of suppression is how we try to cover up warmed over our rancid flavors and, and food products from, from lipid oxidation. And there we're trying to suppress products because the best thing is to add salt because it will enhance uh, salt flavors and, and will pick up more of the beefy flavor and not taste the rancidity. And the other one is to add things that are fat containing like gravy. In all of this is to know that one one attribute can be affect can affect the intensity of another and how they interact. They may be just something that's inherent in the product, but uh, you need and that may be part of what you're testing. But you need to be aware of that. Now, so we have uh, those are the two physical factors we're going to talk about. Psychological factors are a little bit different. And the biggest one that I want to first talk, talk about are, is expectation error. And expectation error is when there's information given with the sample. Uh, a prime example for meat is that meat that's cooked to a lower degree of doneness is more red. If that's what your per preferred method of eating, you would say, ah, this is rare. I like this. It's going to have more serum bloody. Where something that's cooked to a higher degree of doneness, like uh, well, to well done, you may say, oh, this is going to be drier, it's going to be tougher, and it's not going to have as much serum bloody flavor. Whether it does or not, you don't know, but subconsciously you're thinking about that. Also, when we're doing shelf life studies, we don't always tell our panelists that this is a shelf life study. And the reason is they figure out if they come in on day one, uh, three, and five, that the samples are from, have been stored longer and have more off flavor. We don't want them to know that. We don't want them to look for that. I had an expectation error uh, early on when a panel leader had told the panel that we were doing a shelf life study on peanuts, on peanut butter. So the next month when they came back and ate peanut butter, they're like, oh, is this a month old? It's like, no, it was, but they already knew that. So we want to make sure that we don't tell them anything. We reduce the expectation error by keeping the source of the samples a secret. Uh, we have to give them some information for IRB, but we don't have to tell them everything. And we also don't give them any information or detailed information in advance of testing. We use three digit codes. We use random order. Uh, the, and if we need to, we might use light to try to mask certain things. It depends on the study. But we do not want any information coming with the sample. We don't want to change the container, change anything about it, change the size of the product that we did with anything. Error habituation is something we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with our panelists. And this is a tendency to continue to give the same response when a series of slowly increasing or decreasing stimuli are presented. In other words, it's repetitive scoring. If I uh, had you evaluate these three coffees, and just so that you know what they are, uh, this is uh, HEB Holiday Blend Coffee Olay, smells wonderful. This is Miranda Blend uh, from Starbucks, and this is their from their blonde, so it shouldn't be quite as intense. And then this is the Starbucks Breakfast Blend, which is a medium roast. So depending, you know, you immediately think that the HEB coffee is going to taste different than the Starbucks coffee if I let you know that that's what I'm testing. And uh, so that's expectation error. But if we're measuring roasted flavor in these coffees, uh, with time, without really using references, I would worry that there should be differences in roasted flavor. This should be lower than this. And this should be a little bit higher. So I could put them this way for roasted. But if after time, the panelists had started evaluating everything and calling it a five, maybe this is a five, right? And they would not keep spreading their, their samples. So they move to the middle of the scale. So we always have to, we give them references, we, give them, we have to work with them, we have to do training to try to keep them uh, so they don't do that. And I can tell you, we deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis with our panel. And our panel is good. Stimulus error, and that's where irrelevant criteria, style or color of the container influence the server and could suggest differences. 
and I put cheese and wine up here. Uh, we just did a wine study where there was difference in color. It's the same wine initially, but they treated it differently and it changed the color. Well, I'm a red wine drinker. If I have uh, wine that looks not as dark red, I'm going to, whether I know it or not, but mentally, I'm going to say there's not as much fruit flavor in this. And I expect something that's not as bold and uh, probably is a little bit thinner. I mean, I have all these things in my mind that I'm saying, oh yeah, this wine's gonna differ. So we served it in black, painted black, glasses so that you can't really see the color differences. Uh, if we were to serve wine and we came out with a screw cap versus a cork bottle, we could put the good wine in the screw cap and the bad wine in the cork bottle and serve it to people and they'd like prefer the price of the, the cork, especially if you're a consumer. Uh, light versus heavily flavored samples. If I'm testing Gatorade and I have tested Gatorade and and sports drinks, one of the questions that the, that the company was asking, do people like the deeper, darker colored Gatorade or do they like the frosted lighter color? Uh, and so that was part of the study, but uh, when we were studying other things like the flavor, we had to mask the color because when they see the darker colored, like for the fruit flavor, that red, and they see it dark red, they go, oh, it's gonna be fruitier, sweeter. And so we have, that's a stimulant there. Uh, with our train cam, we make frequent and irregular departures. Uh, so in order and manner of presentation, so they don't depend on those things. For consumers, we do a lot of uh, sample control so that there's no information given. Uh, logical error is when two or more characteristics are associated. Uh, for, and I use this, both these two chops were cooked to 145. This one is an enhanced chop, this is a non-enhanced chop. And so the, the issue here is when you see the, this lighter color, you're gonna think that that's gonna be juicier, it's gonna be, um, you, may, you may think, oh yuck, I'm not gonna eat that, right? Because it's too rare, you're used to eating fries that looks like this with just a little bit of paint. So you perceive that this has different flavor than that immediately because of visual appearance. So we try to mask those differences so there's no logical error. Uh, also the halo effect, and this is where uh, when more than one attribute is evaluated in ratings will tend to influence each other. Uh, so one of the things, I, I put this drink back up here because if you have more salt, a lot of times you'll perceive more a higher level of sour uh, because there's a halo effect. Or in chocolate, when you have milk chocolate, you perceive